life. That's God's definitive desire for good in your life. Or you could say it another way. That's God's desire for definitive good in your life. Amen. Amen. That whatever you're going through, wherever you are, that God will work it, use it for good. Amen. We call that favor. Amen. Really, that God's going to turn and use and allow all things to work together for good. That promise over your life and in your life can be called favor. Amen. Even the struggle, favor. Amen. Even the misunderstanding, favor. Amen. Uh, Daniel chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. I'm reading from the NIV as I read from, I try to read from every translation, but the NIV I'm reading from now, Daniel chapter 2, and it reads like this. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. And I'm going to stop there. Amen. Amen. Do me a, a favor and find somebody around you and simply say these words, favor in a foreign land. Come on, find somebody and speak to them. Speak to them. Amen. 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 And now, God, afresh, we confess that you've been good to us. You've watched over us and you've kept us and you keep on keeping us despite of ourself, God. You love us. Even with our misstep, missteps, mistakes, you've been good, God. We give you all the glory. We give you all the praise. There's none like you, God. In fact, God, we could search all over and we still couldn't find anybody that's like you, God. Bless now your word, soul, and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah. This is a peculiar passage that we're sharing in. This peculiar passage, Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2 is a peculiar passage on many ways and at many levels. Let me give you one. One, Daniel chapter 2 is a peculiar passage because like all or most of the Old Testament, Daniel chapter 1 is written in Hebrew. But when you come to Daniel chapter 2, it's no longer written in Hebrew. It's now written in Aramaic. It's a peculiar passage because if you were to understand the context, then it really doesn't make sense. That this king named Nebuchadnezzar, who had just triumphed over Israel, is now struggling, suffering, and troubled. You see, it's a peculiar passage because it says that he had a dream. In fact, he had dreams. But in another way, in a weird way, in a real way, it could be said that he had nightmares. Because these dreams weren't encouraging, weren't uplifting weren't celebratory, but they were discouraging, they were haunting, they were heavy. It's a peculiar passage because when you read the person who is troubled, the king, is in contrast to the person who has peace, the servant, Daniel. Daniel is peculiar because Daniel had every right to be downcast. Daniel had every right to be discouraged. Daniel had every right to live a life filled with division and be divisive. Daniel had every right to be despondent. But when you read the entire book of Daniel, you never see someone who is downcast. Instead, you see someone who has this constant, supernatural, this favor of God, peace, this satisfaction over his life and his position and his place. Daniel is a peculiar prophet, and this is a peculiar passage, because Daniel is in a foreign land. I don't know if you've ever thought about what it means to be in a foreign land, to be in a place where you have been forced to be where you are. It could be through slavery. It could be through circumstance. But you are in a foreign land. Some of you work in an environment and every day you go to work, you know you're not like the others. You may look like them, you may dress like them, you may talk like them, but there's something within you that reminds you, don't pretend, don't play, don't lie to yourself, you don't fit in here. In fact, there's somebody even in worship today, and you feel like a foreigner in the house of God. Well, I want to let you know that this passage is powerful because it talks to the fact and the reality that you have been 
destined for favor even in a foreign land. That's the picture of Daniel. It's someone who's been destined for favor even in a foreign land. Here it is, this king has dream after dream. He can't seem to grasp his mind around the dream, but he knows it is not a good dream. It troubles him. He wakes up in the middle of the night. He calls his servants. They can't do anything for him. There's no tongues, but he's troubled. He has heartburn, literally. He doesn't know what to do. Finally, he says, I'm going to call all my peoples together. He calls the astrologers. He calls the magicians. He calls everybody together. He calls the soothsayers. He calls all the spiritual folk. In that day, spirituality was king. In this day, intellectualism is king. But whether it's spirituality or intellectualism, the idea is that there's looking for an answer that they don't have. Can I talk to you for a moment? This world is looking for an answer that they don't have. They're uncomfortable and they're uneasy. They don't know who to look to, who to turn to. One year they'll vote for Barack Obama, another year they'll vote for Donald Trump. I mean, it's just they're just looking for something. This world is in trouble looking for something. And yet, Yet in the midst of that scene, when the king declares that he needs someone to interpret the dream, they all come together and say, cool, king, we've helped you out before. We'll interpret the dream. The king says his name, Nebuchadnezzar, I'm not going to tell you the dream. You are going to tell me my dream and interpret my dream. The king had a little understanding because he knew that people like to play with spiritual things. People like to pretend with spiritual things. They lie about spiritual things. So he said, if I tell you the dream, then your interpretation will be untested. But to test the dream, you got to tell me what the dream is. If you tell me what the dream is, then, and interpret it, then I'll know that you're real and sincere. Well, at that, they said, now look, king, nobody can do what you're asking us to do. That's impossible. That, that's not realistic. That's an impossibility. And that's where the king loses his cool. He just had this triumph and now he's troubled, but he's really a tyrant because what he does here, he responds with this decree. He says, fine, I'm going to kill all y'all and everybody. I'm going to kill you. And at that, they go cuckoo for crazy. They, they go crazy. They all upset. They're troubled. They don't know what to do. Say when a young man named Daniel's here Hears the, the story. He hears that, look, we're all going to be killed. And you'll notice what Daniel does not do. Daniel does not trip. Daniel does not start cussing and fussing. Daniel doesn't even get upset. In fact, the only thing that's notable change in Daniel's behavior is he stops by his friend's house and he says, look y'all, I need you to pray that God will reveal to me Nebuchadnezzar's nightmare or dream. That's the story of Daniel and in a very real sense I believe that's the story of all of us because all of us from time to time will discover that we are are favored in a foreign land. And I think that we can learn a lot from how to find and gain success through this favor in a foreign land by looking at the life, looking at the life of Daniel. Okay, y'all not feeling me? Let me help to explain what it looks like to be in a foreign land. In fact, you know the Psalm, Psalm 137, how can we sing in a foreign land? You know, we'll hang our willows, we'll weep in a foreign land. It means to be in a foreign land that you don't have a say of what happens to you. Okay, that didn't get you. It means to be in a foreign land that you don't have the wealth that others have in this land. Okay, you see, you see when, I, when I say wealth, you guys are thinking of gen our first generation wealth. When I say wealth, I mean old money. Well, when you can say, I made it by myself, pulled myself up by my bootstrap, my father gave me a $5 million loan. Amen. Amen. Yeah, yeah. See, a lot of us in here, when we went off to do what we went off to do to the military or to college, we did it on a wing and a prayer. We, we didn't have anybody backing us saying, well, okay, Jimmy, if you need more money, I'll send you 20000 We We didn't have a couple cars to choose from and a whole lot of extra stuff because, in a real sense, we're foreigners in this land. We don't have what so many have. We're in a strange land. Okay, let me give you another one. To be in a strange land, to be a foreigner in this land, 
that means that you don't have the same legacy that others have. There's nothing named for you except for MLK Boulevard. Amen. You, you, you don't have buildings named after you. You don't even know your history. I'm not talking about one generation, two generations. I'm talking about 200 years ago. Where were you? Where were you? You're a foreigner. You, 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 that's why you act the way you act sometimes because you know what it is to be an outsider in a group of insiders. And so was Daniel. He was an outsider in a group of insiders. And yet he was not despondent or filled with despair. And I believe his testimony can be our testimony even though we're in a strange land. Even though we're foreigners. Even though we don't have what others have. We can still have a certain peace and a certain assurance and a certain satisfaction. That's the testimony of Daniel and that should be your testimony too. Let me show you the first thing that Daniel teaches us and how we can have this level of uh, peace, satisfaction, and even success. First, first, he had the right relationships. Yeah, he had the right relationship. This is so important, and I'm going to mess with you when I start with the first one, because notice his relationship. I'm not talking about first with his friends. I, I'm not talking about first with his God, but notice his relationship with his enemy. Notice how he dealt with the king, Nebuchadnezzar. And we saw this before in Daniel chapter 1. He had a great deal of respect for this foreign king. Now, I'm not saying that he had to worship the king. I'm not saying he had to agree with the king, but he knew how to interact with this foreign king. And this is so important because if you don't get this, then you'll always be upset with people who differ from you. Look, you got to learn to un understand people. Okay, I grew up in the 90s. That when I was a teenager. And there was a song that said, don't take it personal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was the idea that, look, you got to understand that you can't take everything personal. That, look, some people are going to be the people they are regardless of what you do. I don't know if you ever grew up in a neighborhood with dogs. If you ever grew up in a neighborhood with dogs, you'll notice that no matter what you did, that dog barked at you. But hopefully, you never got to the point where you got on your knees and started barking at that dog. Because you understood it's just a doggy dog world. And come here and let me talk to you. And this is for all of you. You need to understand, thank you so much, that sometimes the way thank you, people treat you and mistreat you has nothing to do with you. Yeah. Don't be upset because they acting like that. It just shows that they got an issue. And their issue with you is not your issue. Yeah. And, and look, if you can understand that, then you can sympathize and even empathize for their behavior. You won't be upset. You'll simply say, they always been that way. They're always that way. That's not my fault, nor will I react to their bad behavior. Instead, I'm going to do my best to be my best because I am who I am. Amen. A child of God. The sooner you understand that, you'll start trying, you'll stop trying to manipulate the situation and try to explain who you are and what you are and where you're from and why you do, what you do, how you do. No, just accept that that's who they are and that's what they, they don't have to like you. And look, you don't have to like them. Okay, I knew this would happen. Let me see if I can break this down. Look, as Christians, sometimes we make the mistake of thinking everybody has to be our friend. Everybody has to love us and like us. Everybody has to want to come by our house and eat with us and be with us and be close to us. Look, everybody doesn't have to love you and like you. Get over it. It's, it's okay. That's all right. Look, you can learn to interact with people, to work with people who are nothing like you. And that's all right. Look, Dan. Daniel did it, and this king Nebuchadnezzar had a foreign God. But look, while Daniel did it, Daniel wasn't mad. Daniel never says anything derisive or divisive about the king Nebuchadnezzar. Instead, he shows him respect and kindness, and I believe it's because he had a sense of sympathy and empathy for him. He understood, you don't know God, and anytime you don't know God, you won't act godly. Amen. Stop expecting people who are not saved to act saved, to live saved, and to be saved. And if somebody says they're saved, but they're not acting saved, just look at the fruit and say, well, 
well, one day they might get saved. Amen. Don't be upset. Just pray that they'll see God. Because the truth is, if it had not been for God in your life, yeah, the truth is, if God didn't hold your tongue, the truth is, if God didn't save your life, the truth is, if it just, if we look back in your closet, in your history, uh, you, you, you have some, some skeletons. In fact, some of y'all got some bodies in your closet. Amen. The truth is, we all have made some mistakes, have done some wrong, have acted out. Yes, we have. And so when we understand that we can interact with people who are unsaved, we can interact with people who are ungodly, we can interact with people who are unkind and still be strategic and still be sagacious and still be spiritual, then God can bless us. Never make the mistake that God only wants you to interact with saved people. That doesn't, it's not throughout the scriptures. Daniel had a relationship with Nebuchadnezzar so much so, if you read on to around verse 27, when he had the dream, look, he walks in he walked into the king's room to speak to the king why was he able to do that because he had garnished a relationship with the king who did not agree with him please get this the people on your job shouldn't think that you're so spiritual that you can't be touched Stop praying in tongues on your job and speak in English to them. And if they speak Spanish, learn a couple of Spanish words and speak in Spanish to them. That's the obligation of the believer. We keep wanting people to deal with us on our level. The only way they can deal with us on our level is to know Christ because we're on a whole different level. Amen. Praise God. Let me move on. First, his relationship with someone who should have and could have been his enemy. Remember, this king took him from his people, more than likely killed his parents. Look, this king was a harsh, cruel tyrant, and yet he respected him enough to deal with him and try to help him to get to the next level. That's how you ought to deal with people. The next next time somebody mistreats you, the next time somebody harasses you, the next time someone offends you, you decide that it's your job to help them. Okay, y'all are feeling me. I don't know if you watched the news recently. I was watching the news recently, and, and it was a prison guard. He was a prison guard. He had taken a group of inmates. Look, he had taken a group of inmates to clean the streets along the freeway. This was in Georgia. And as he was doing this, he had a heart attack. The, the guard had a heart attack. And the next time, when he woke up, look, his bulletproof vest was gone, his gun was gone, and his cell phone was gone. And you know what they were doing to him? They were helping him. Yeah. They had taken off his bulletproof vest. They had taken his guard and they had taken the cell phone to call an ambulance and he lived and survived only because the inmates saved him. Now I gotta ask you a question. Yeah, if you were a guard in a prison, would the inmates respect you and appreciate you so much that they would help you when you were down and out? You better treat folk right because you never know. Some of y'all missing this. Look, well, do the students in your classroom know that you appreciate? Do the people who you have authority over and rank over know that you appreciate them for who they are and what they are? Or do they feel like you... Okay, let me just move on. So it's a relationship with the people who could be and even should be your enemy. But not only that relationship, but look at the other relationship. He had a relationship with a few close friends. Three! And I got to preach this hard. Please get this. Look, I don't know who told you that you needed a whole lot of friends. Some of y'all who have a whole lot of friends really have no friends. Look, if you have more than about 10 friends, I, I think you misunderstand what a true friend is. In fact, in your life, in your whole life, look, wake your neighbor up because they need to get this. If you have three good ride or die friends, you're blessed for life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you got three people who will show up when everyone walks out, you're blessed for life. If you got, if you got somebody who will stand with you with nobody who will stand with you, you're blessed for life. I get that. Please get that. Because we're living in a day when I got 4,500 plus friends on Facebook. Yeah, just because you got 4,500 plus friends on Facebook doesn't mean you have 4,000 but and 500 friends in life. You need a few people. A few people. And look, the, 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 this is so important because you need to identify them and then you need to invest in them. 
All right, oh, good God, this is good. And this is important because throughout this life, you need somebody who will tell you the truth. You need somebody who will lift you up and help you out. You need somebody who's a true friend. Okay, I know I'm in the Bible. Tell me who Jesus had as his true friends. Anybody? Okay, he had 12 disciples. And his disciples, in a very real sense, were either his colleagues or his protégés. Or his mentees. But he had three ride or die friends. Who said that? Who said that? Thank you. Somebody goes to Cyber. Look, I'm preaching. I need your help. Look, he had Peter, James, and the one he loved, John. The Bible said he could put his shoulder on, he could put his head on John's shoulder. And he could go to him and talk to him when nobody, you better have somebody that no matter how late at night it is, you can say, I need to talk. Because I feel like doing something crazy. And the truth is, if you identify them and invest in them, they'll be there for life. And look, and they'll be there for life and they'll be a blessing in your life. That's what Daniel had. Notice throughout his journey, he had these three same Hebrew brothers. Now look, there were a lot of people taken in captive into Babylon, but these were his true, true ride or die friends. And I'm just praying to God that you have three in your life. Three, you ought to count it. Three, look for them. Think about it right now. Three who you can count on. Okay, I'll move on because the next set it, it, we move into, and we're almost done. The next set we move into is, is not his relationship with his enemy or a could be enemy or his frenemy, amen. But look, not just his relationship with his friends, but his relationship with God. And we're going to talk about this deep and in depth more, but, but just for a moment, look at his relationship with God. He had such a relationship with God that he recognized God and he reverenced God. Okay, y'all missing this. Look, notice as soon as something went down, as soon as he got a death threat. Have you ever had a death threat? Yeah, uh-huh, yeah. Have you ever had somebody tell you, we're going to take you out? Have you ever have someone write you a letter, we know what school your kids go to, and you better stop, or we're going to take you out? Uh-huh. Yeah, well, there's something about getting death threats, you know, and, and they're true death threats that somebody really wants to kill you. And they'll tell you, we want to lynch you. They'll say to you, we want to get you. There's something about having that level of animosity, someone really coming after you and being crazy enough. There's something about that. Look, he had all this going on, but he didn't lose it. He kept his cool. And the reason he was able to keep his cool or keep his cool is because immediately, as soon as he heard the threat, as soon as he heard the bad news, as soon as he saw the report, as soon as the doctor said what he said, as soon as the financial report came out, you know what he did? He went straight to God. And then he went to friends to go to God. Okay, y'all missing this. I thought this would happen. I am a pugilist fan. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a pugilist fan. I would be a pugilist myself, but I don't like to get hit. Amen. Look, so... I really enjoy boxing. I really do. I'm a fan of boxing. And where I used to serve, Sergeant Major was my good friend, and he was a former professional boxer. And we had this little boxing thing for kids, and they would come and box. I mean, it was wonderful with my friend West Belmont. So we enjoyed boxing. And I remember one time he told me something. He said, look, you got to understand this. If you ever get hit, I mean, really hard, and you hit the canvas, you get knocked down to the floor, what you don't want to do is jump up on your feet. And I couldn't understand. And I said, well, of course you jump up on your feet because they're counting. He said, no, no, no. If you jump up on your feet too fast, when you jump up on your feet, you'll fall again right down. So instead of jumping up on your feet, the first thing you do when you get knocked down and hit real hard is you just get up on one knee. And you stay on one knee and wait for the count. One, two, three, four. Five. And he said around seven, that's when you stand up. He said when you do that, you can collect yourself. You can get yourself back together. And how much more in a spiritual sense? How much more when you've got a spiritual hit and you've been spiritually knocked down and you're fatigued and confused and clouded in your head? How much more? Don't run and go and do something. Don't run and react. Don't write back. Don't put a post on Facebook about them. Don't do that. But instead what you do, just get on your knees and talk to God. 
God, God, I don't know what to do. God, I don't know what's going on. God, I don't know how I got where I got to. God, I thought I paid this bill. God, I thought I was doing. God, what happened? And you talk to God. And when you talk to God, God will clarify your thoughts. God will give you conviction. God will give you confidence. And God will give you clarity because you spend time on your knees. That was his relationship with God. But I told you not only about his relationship with God, but what about his reverence for God? Would you say that reverence? Now we're living in a day when reverence is out of style. We're living in a profane day. People say and do anything anywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You asking about God? I don't believe in God. Blank your God. I don't need to talk to you. It's a profane day. Look, but we as believers have a reverence for God. We recognize that there are certain things I don't do because I revere God. I respect God's house because God is still in charge. He's still powerful. He still corrects those who are wrong. I respect God. I don't want God to have to slap me or backhand me. Amen. Look, and so Daniel respected God. Here Here's how I know. Because go on to read chapter 2. I didn't read the whole chapter. It was too long. But I want you to read it when you get home. Because when the king calls him in in verse 28, the king, he comes in. And this is what he says. The king Nebuchadnezzar says, you can interpret the dream? His response is, no. I cannot interpret the dream. No man can interpret this dream. But my God can interpret this dream. Can I show you something? You know you revere God when you refuse to take credit for anything that God has done. Somebody says to you, oh, you're so intellectual. Oh, you did such a good job with your children. Oh, you gave so much to the church. And you say, "Uh uh-uh. I can't take credit. God did that. You've been married for such and such. Mm, mm, mm. My wife and God did that. When you revere God, you have to be honest with folk. You, you have to be truthful with folk. You got to say, God did it. And he did it suddenly. It's marvelous in our sight. God made this thing happen. God built it. God shaped it. God saved it. God helped it. God did this. Yeah, when you really respect and revere God, you want everybody to know that you know that had it not been for the Lord on your side, where would you be? You want everybody to know that yes, it was a heart attack, and yes, I was going to die, and yes, I should have been, I should be dead. But you know what God did? God confused the doctors. You know what God did? God confused the teachers. You know what God did? God made my professors do right by me no do graciously by me and gave me another chance I thank God if it had not been for God that's reverence because reverence respects all he does and all he is and I'm just challenged to pause for a minute and ask you do you reverence God enough so on your 9 to 5 I'm not talking about Sunday go ahead and shout on Sunday that's good go ahead and praise God on Sunday but what about Monday Tuesday Wednesday Thursday Friday and Saturday night do you tell your neighbors? Do you tell your friends? Do you tell your frenemies? Do you tell anybody who asks that it's the Lord that's done this? And I thank God because if it was me, it wouldn't be. But because of God, it is. Do people in the cubicle next to you know that you love the Lord? They know you like the Cowboys, the Redskins, and the Giants. They know how, what kind of music you like. They know what kind of car you drive, what kind of car you want. They know what kind of dog you want. They know they know a whole lot about you. But do they know that it's the Lord that has sustained you? Do they know that the Lord, they know that you can't stand Donald Trump and that you love Barack Obama. But do they know that the Lord has stood by your side, that the Lord has made ways, that the Lord did it? Do they know that you were diagnosed with this? And with that, do they know that your child was incarcerated? Do they know that the Lord kept your mind when you thought you were going to lose? Do they know when you revere God, when you walk through this life saying, Oh no, it's not me, it is He. Oh no, it's not my work, it's Him. Oh no. Daniel, in fact, goes on and he has a praise break. Literally, the 
text changed to a psalm. And he starts saying that my God, our God, is the God that sustains everything, is the God that does everything, is the God that controls everything. He turns kingdoms. He lifts up presidents, he says kings, but I'm saying presidents, and bring down presidents. He sends mulers and he sends all these other things. God is in control of it all. God is my sustainer, and this is the Lord's doing. Okay, I, I got to take my seat. You've been wonderful. Now, I hope, I hope, I hope that you are revering God enough, not just to respect him by worshiping him privately, but to revere him enough by giving him public credit for everything that he does, you know, for everything that he does and everything that he did. Can I be honest with you for a moment? I'm not mad at you, but I'm mad at some Christians. I'm mad at the person to your left because we like to pretend when we've achieved something, when we've accomplished something, that we didn't go through hell and high waters. We don't want people to know that we have had trouble. We don't want people to know that our credit score was jacked up from the floor up. We don't want people to know that our health was, we, we, oh no, oh no, you know, when I went to, when I went to Princeton and did you know, work there and uh, now, you know, New Brunswick and I'm doing work there. I chose that because it was closer to home. I could have gone to Princeton. I'll, in fact, I'll be taking class there soon. And, and uh, you know, we, we, we walk through life like, oh yes, you know, my child graduated here. Don't you, you know you are on your knees crying saying, God, please Lord. You know you got a notice in the mail. One more missed payment. And you know that if it wasn't financial, it was relational. If it wasn't relational, it was health. You may have a million dollars in the bank, but you don't have perfect health. All of us got some troubles and some hurt. All of us have come through some valleys and some pain. All of us have been kept by God. And since you've been kept by God, whether you're driving the best or you got the best bus pass, since you've been kept by God, if it's just your mind, that's been kept. You ought to give them all the credit. I got one more. I got one more. But look, look, look. Daniel, and I can't give you all the history, but Daniel is peculiar, not just in the writing and not just in the tone, but Daniel is peculiar because Daniel is not considered a prophet in Judaism. He is not called a prophet in Judaism because there are two major qualifiers to be a prophet for the Jew. Look, the first major qualifier is God has to speak to you. And God did speak to him. But the next major qualifier is you have to speak to God's people. Oh God, help me get this, help me get this. Look, every other prophet, now there's two others that we can argue about, Nahum, Abadiah, uh, but, but look, every other prophet spoke to either the southern kingdom or the northern kingdom. You, you remember the first king, Saul, second king, David, third king, Solomon, divided kingdom, right? You remember the kingdoms. And they each had corresponding prophets. But look, the problem with Daniel is Daniel didn't speak to God's people. Daniel, he was there to reach the reprobate. You know, my mom used to use that word when I, when I used to act up as a boy and do something stupid, foolish, or, or she found out that I was really looking at a girl that I, you, you, never mind. She said, don't you be no reprobate, you know. Uh, another way, a, a sinner. Another way, unsaved. Another way, lost. Another way, outside of the ark of safety. Yeah. And so look, Daniel's major message was not to Israel, was not to Judah, was not even to those who are saved. But God chose Daniel to be sent to a people and a person who were absolutely reprobate. God sent Daniel to Babylon and a man named Nebuchadnezzar. Now you need to know Nebuchadnezzar will later, we're going to look at this, he would go crazy. He was already a tyrant. He was already on the edge. And Babylon, the whore of Babylon, was evil. And yet God said, I'm going to send my prophet to you because I have a heart for the reprobate. Come on now, y'all missing this. Now I got to take my seat because the hard thing is that it's hard to be a prophet. In fact, it was Jesus and Luke who said, haven't you persecuted all the prophets and all those who have been sent? Look, and can I talk to you? Can I talk to you? Can I talk to you on your pew? You have been sent. Notice this, that God didn't allow Daniel to be in 
this foreign land, this strange land, because he just wanted to punish Daniel. But instead, God allowed Daniel to be there because he needed somebody to be a witness, somebody who would raise their voice, somebody who would walk in and say, uh-uh, y'all, let's rethink the way we're acting. And, and, whoa, wait a minute. I don't think, and have you thought about the goodness of God? How have you thought about God is still sending prophets to foreign and re retrobate people. And the good news is, and the hard news is, you've been sent. God is looking at you. I know I'm in the Bible. Because whenever God is pleased with somebody, he lifts them up so they can be examples. To uh, Come here, Job. Have you considered Job my servant? Yeah. And God lifted him up, and he took the pain and the pressure. But then God, okay, I'm just going to take my seat on this. Have you thought about Jesus who was lifted up so that others might see and follow him and call on him? That's the reason God has you where he has you. Stop trying to run away and find the most comfortable place. Stop trying to find the most easy place. Stop trying to get to a place that's comfortable, that everything is together. I like it over here because I don't have to do anything but enjoy myself. That's not being a prophet. That's not being a priest. That's not being a preacher. That's not being a disciple. That's being... Nothing. You ain't nothing. And God can't use you. And can I talk to you? The truth is, I know there's something inside of you that wants to be used by God. I know there's something inside you that wants to be tested by God, trusted by God. I Okay, I played basketball. I did. I really did. I played basketball for all of two seasons. Well, really one and a half season. And I'll never forget when I got in, the coach really needed me because the cheerleaders had been chatting, put Hodari in. Put Oh, God, we in. Yeah, because it, it had been like two months into the season and I hadn't got on the pod. And so when I finally got on the pod, I was so glad to be on the team. I was so glad to be in the game. And can I talk to you? Maybe one of the reasons life isn't as effervescent as it ought to be, as joyful as it ought to be, is because you've been sitting on the bench, the pew. You've been sitting on the pew. I want to call your attention. God wants you in the fight. God wants to use you. God wants somebody to look at you and say, if they can be married, I can be married. If they can be single and still holy, I can be single and still holy. If they can be married to them, then I can be married to him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. God wants somebody to see you. See you come through the grief of losing a loved one. See you come through retirement and now working again. See you come through through hard struggles and situations. See you come through parenting a knucklehead or knuckleheads. See you come through layoff and this off and that and then say I can do it like you can do it. God has called you not to be comfortable. God has called you not to have favor that lets you be nothing and do nothing but to have favor that makes a difference in the world. God says I want you to add flavor to this world. Oh yeah, I'm going to take my seat but I love to drink tea and I always drink the, the strongest tea. I always drink the boldest tea. I like tea that makes a difference. If my tea bag doesn't change the color of my water, if my tea bag doesn't change the flavor of my water, if my tea bag does nothing in my water, then there's two possibilities. One is that's a bad tea bag. <laughs> The second is, the water was not hot enough to stir up the flavor in the tea bag. Come here, baby. As I take my seat, God is saying, I've called you to make a difference. i put flavor inside of you. I've chosen you. Now, there's two possibilities. One, you're a bad tea bag. You're not. So the only thing that God has to do now is turn up the temperature in your life so you'll make a difference where you go, so you stand up where you go. That's your calling. That's your purpose. That's your raison d'etre. God never wastes a life. God never wastes a time. God never wastes a test. God never wastes a struggle. God is saying, I want to use you where you are. I want to use you in this season. I want to use you in your brokenness. I want to use you in your confusion. I want to use you when nobody else likes you. I want to use you. The only question is, where are you? Let God use you. You say, I got a bad knee. I got a bad knee. I, I, I have a struggle. I, I have temptation. I, I have this. I have that. That's fine. That's why he can use you. He can use you 
just like you are. But you got to say, I've got the favor of flavor, and I want to be used. I want to be used. Anyway, Lord, you can use me. Anyway, I want to be used. I know it won't be easy. I know it won't be comfortable. I know it might hurt. I know it might be hard. But I know you're a keeper. So use me, God. Use me, God. Use me, God. Hallelujah. We're standing to our feet. The gospel has been preached. Song like that. Anyway, anyhow. Uh, I'm trying to figure out the next the next line. Uh, it's in my head. Uh, um, I want to be used anyway, anyhow. You know the song? I want to be used. <laughs> Y'all don't know that song? Anyhow, anyway, anyhow. Uh, something about I want to be used. I'm not the oldest one anyway, anyhow. Y'all don't know that song? Okay, that's fine. Praise God. Amen. We're standing to our feet. The gospel has been preached. We're going to find that song. I'm sure I'm singing like three keys away from where it's supposed to be, but that's fine. Look, we're standing to our feet because the doors of the church are open, and that means if you're here today and you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, God appointed you for this time, for this place, God chose you to be here today. It is not an accident. Don't get distracted. It's not an incident. God brought you here because he wanted you to hear the word that you've been selected for this. You've been appointed to this. He, at the beginning of eternity, at the cradle of creation, said, I want to use you. In your old age, in your young age, in your struggle, in your temptation, I want to use you. If you're here today and you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is the beginning of 2019. And I want to tell you how to make this a great year. You can make this a great year if you make it with God. If you make it with God. If you make it with God. Now, you're here today. If you've not accepted Jesus Christ, today we want you to accept Jesus Christ. Now, simply put... It seems too simple to be true. I mean, it seems like, oh, gosh, that's, that's so simple. But the Bible says that if you open up your heart, that you declare with your mouth and believe in your heart that you're saved, that doesn't mean that there are growing lessons. That doesn't mean that he doesn't sanctify you. But it does mean that's the starting place. So if you're here today, you've never accepted Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, today, right now, today, right now, you can come. Raise your hand. Someone will walk with you. You can come for salvation. You can come for salvation. You can come for salvation. I believe you're here. Not only for that, for baptism. Now you may have said before, okay, I want to be baptized, but for some reason you weren't. You may have gotten busy. You may have gotten scared. Your schedule may have gotten full. Well, I want to tell you that baptism is important because it's a step of faith. And God doesn't move simply by minutes and seconds and hours. But he moves by seasons and steps. It's your season to take this step. If you know that you haven't been baptized, you believe the scriptures, you need to be baptized. Take the step of faith. You say, well, Reverend, I'm just 